Hallelujah. Amen? All right. Well, let's go ahead. We'll, we'll go ahead and get into this. We're going to pick up uh, from Sunday. And because uh, you know, Sunday night we came in, and if you weren't here, we had an awesome time of worship. Uh, Nathan just got, we, we're going to have him sing a couple of songs. And it just the anointing kind of came in a way we just said, can't stop. And just, he just took the whole service and kept going. Hallelujah. And so we had about an hour of just singing and worshiping the Lord and uh, getting ministered to. A couple of songs by the Holy Ghost in the middle. Um, hallelujah. So, amen. Uh, Sunday we started, on, we, we, got, we talked about the fact we were going to recover walking by faith and not by sight. Because we've been so interrupted with you know, so many different events, guest speakers and traveling to Tulsa, et cetera, to uh, pick up the girls. So um, we, just, we, we recovered some ground and then went off in a different direction, as usual. Um, pretty much how it happens around here. Amen? So we talked about, number one, you've got to be accepted. Uh, to be accept, to be accepted, we must walk by faith. Amen? Um, we, in 2 Corinthians 5, 9, then Hebrews eleven six, 6. And um, walking in the flesh, you can't please God. Romans 8, 8. They that are in the flesh cannot please God. If you're a Christian and you're walking in the flesh, you can't please God. God doesn't mean God doesn't love you. It means you can't please God. Some people misinterpret uh, displeasure to God or whatever with him rejecting you or casting you. Well, that's not true. Uh, it is the path. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Walking in the flesh and walking in sin is a path to ultimate destruction if you don't change some things over time. Okay? Um, talked about, oh, Thomas's kind of faith, Bible faith, how word faith goes above the senses. Um, we're to have Abraham's faith. And um, we were kind of getting into that when um, we stumbled across the scripture we were using. Anybody remember what, what, what we were using? We're talking about over there in 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9, talking about he gives uh, seed to the sower and bread to the eater. He that ministers seed to the sower, both ministers bread for food and multiplies your seed sown and increases the fruits of your righteousness. And we got, we got talking about how that people misinterpret um, the bread for food as the harvest. And uh, totally missed the point. You know, God, God um, gives bread for the food. It, that is a mercy. It really, it's a mercy to sustain you until harvest comes in. So if you, you know, if you didn't get to hear that Sunday morning, you need to go back and listen to that. Um, I'm sure Brother Bill will have it out soon and very soon. It's out there. Let's see what else we got to look at here. So we were, um, so we got, we got to that point and kind of got hung there. And... Um, because we were talking about, when we went off in that direction, how that um, James talked about that we were not, um, let's look over there. How that, you know, people say I'm justified without works. Whereas James says, show me your faith without your works, I'll show you my faith by my works. Hallelujah. Now it's from James chapter 2. Um, we, we read down from, um, we'll just kind of recover this. All right. My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect to persons. For if there come into your assembly a man with a gold ring and, godly, uh, and, and goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man with vile raiment, and you have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou here, or sit here under my footstool, are you not then partial in yourselves and become judge, and, and become judges of evil thoughts? Now, what we're saying here is, you just can't, because it's it's a, it's a normal thing. Somebody comes in well dressed, where people want to, hey, well, you want them in your church. What's the bottom line always? The love of money. Amen. Hallelujah. Now it doesn't. I want to say something because you have money doesn't mean you have the love of money. As quite, as quite frankly, as a matter of fact. There's a lot of poor people that love money. They steal for it. They shoot for it. They kill for it. They do it because they love money. So just because somebody, you can't go, oh, they rich folk, they, they, they evil because they love money. Well, I'm going to tell you, they're poor folk that love money. All right? Um, 
hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom, which he hath promised to them that love him? In other words, he's rebuking them for judging the status of a person basically on, based on how they, how they dress and going after um, rich people. You know, churches do it all the time. You know, somebody comes in, they look like they're mon they've got money bags. Well, you, you court them. Nobody courts the poor-looking guy. Amen? Honestly, they don't court the poor-looking guy. But ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by which ye are called? If you fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. But if you have respect to persons, you commit sin. That's heavy. And, uh, amen? And are convinced of the law as transgressors. For whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet if in one point he is guilty of all. For he that said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not kill. Now if thou commit no adultery, and yet if you kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So speak ye, and, do, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. For he shall have judgment without mercy, and he show, has showed no mercy, and mercy rejoices to get judgment, judgment. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith, and hath not works, can faith save him? So here's, that was his introduction into this passage of Scripture, was, um, uh, and people amaze you, they'll, they'll, do it, they'll do it in the New Testament. Well, I'm not under law, so I can, I can commit adultery, as long as I love people. I love the Lord, but I'm, I'm getting drunk on the weekends. Well, James said, see, now understand this, that we're not called to live under the law in the new covenant. But the concept here, and that's what James is pointing out, that if you think you can just sin in one area and not sin in another, and that makes it okay, he's saying you're guilty of the whole thing. In other words, if you think you can get away with stuff just because you walk in love, or I'm under grace. And it's all right if I do this other stuff because he says you're guilty of the whole law if you're doing that kind of thing. So if you're not, if you're, if you're not loving the poor that come into your midst, you're in sin. You're guilty of the whole law. In other words, it's a choice you make. Okay? And, and that's why this whole bunch came out with a, 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 about a year ago saying don't read uh, Peter, James, and John because they disagree with Paul and Paul's the preacher of grace. Because it disagreed with their doctrine. Well, it's not even do I mean, it's not doctrine. It, they disagree with their error. Okay? Doctrine is biblical. You know. All right. Whosoever should keep the whole law and yet and offend in one point, he's guilty of the whole thing. He that said, Do not commit adultery and do, and do not also said, Do not kill. If you commit adultery, yet if you, if you don't commit adultery, but if you kill, you're become a transgressor of the law. So speak ye and so do as they that shall be judged. Listen by the law of liberty. He said, do and live like you're being judged by the law of liberty. But understand, see, you can't totally separate out what he said here and go, I'm under grace because I'm under the law of liberty. He said, so speak ye. In other words, so here is a conjunction that carries the implication because of what came before, speak ye. Because what I said before, and do, is somebody's going to be judged under the law of liberty. In other words, the law of liberty may be judging you, but you're still to conduct yourself in a way and carry out your life in a way that honors God and honors his word. And don't think that you can do and get away with simply because you're under the law of liberty. Okay? For he shall have judgment without mercy that has showed no mercy. And mercy rejoices against judgment. Now he said that right after talking about being judged by the law of liberty. He'll have judgment with no mercy against them that have no mercy. So if you're under grace and you're showing no mercy, you're going to be judged without mercy. I don't want to say you that. Well, I don't care what you receive. It's Bible. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save him? I've got faith in the finished work of Jesus. Well, Ephesians chapter 2, 
Verse 8, 9, and 10 is, For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But he goes on right after that and says, We are created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Amen? Isn't that what he says? All right. For, verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created on, in Christ Jesus unto good works. Now, wait a second. We are saved by grace through faith, not of that, not yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. What's he talking about? You can't obtain righteousness by doing everything the law says and by doing good things. You're not going to become righteous. But you are his workmanship. You're in Christ Jesus, and there should be good works that follow your faith. Not laying down on the couch potato looking at the finished work. I don't do anything. I don't tithe. I don't give. I don't go to church. I don't do anything. I don't have to submit. I don't have to. I had somebody tell me this one time. I, I, I know I've said it a bunch, but I, I still get amazed they said it. I think it was a thread on, on, on a post about radical grace, and I said something, and they, because they went, I don't, now that I'm under grace, I don't have to tithe. Well, you're created in Christ Jesus under good works. And Hebrews 11 says he receiveth the tithe. That's a good work. Amen. Are you here? I don't have to obey. We're created in Christ Jesus under good works. And the word of God says, obey those with the rule over you. Or submit yourselves to those with the rule over you. I don't have to go to church. Yet, we're created in Christ Jesus under good works. And the word of God says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as a manner of some. Are you here and you're going home? See, we are created under good works. Our faith is revealed and demonstrated by works or corresponding actions to that faith. If I believe Jesus saved me, I'm born again, I am his workmanship, then I am supposed to have Actions that demonstrate that. I mean, because I've heard everything that person said they no longer had to do was something in the New Testament that the Word of God told you to do. Every last one of them. Don't have to give, don't have to tithe, don't have to go to church, don't have to obey, don't have to submit. I mean, it just went on and on and on. You're, when you confuse Obtaining righteousness by the works of the law, where Paul refers to works. Amen. See, that's, that's why people say, say Paul and James disagree, because James just says, you know, you say you have faith without works, show me your faith without your works, and I'll show you my faith by your works, and so forth. You know, what does it profit, my brother, though a man say he hath faith and hath not works, can faith save him? For by grace you say through faith that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. People say Paul and James were disagreeing. They're not in disagreement here. They're actually in perfect harmony. Because, where is it, where is it, where is it, where is it? Where, oh, where is it? Hallelujah. Acts chapter 14, verse 7. And there they preached the gospel. Now, according to some people, that's the gospel only of grace. Only of grace. Okay, I don't care what you call it. It's the gospel. I looked at one time. The gospel, it's only referred to as the gospel of grace like twice. It's called all kinds of other gospels. The gospel that like 15 and 20 times other things it's referred to as. Okay? There they preached the gospel of grace, of Christ, of the Lord Jesus Christ, of God, you know. And there sat a certain man at Lystra, impotent in his feet, being crippled from his mother's womb, who never walked. The same heard Paul speak, and who steadfastly beholding him, perceiving that he had faith to be healed. Can I ask you a question? Is he healed? Because he sat there. Paul looked, they heard Paul preach. Paul looked at him. And perceived by the Holy Ghost, he had faith to be healed. Can faith save you alone? Paul said with a loud voice, stand upright on thy feet. 
and he leaped and walked. What did he do? He had to act. He had to put an action, a corresponding action to that faith for it to work. It did not work until there was a corresponding action. Now, <clears throat> well, I mean, how do you get saved? Well, Romans 8. I'm off my notes again, by the way. Just in case you were wondering. I mean, my iPads are, are turned off. Okay? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm at Romans 10. 10.8, that's what, that's what I meant. Hallelujah. Romans 10.8, but what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt, what? Confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart God's raised from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Now stop for a second. He's believing in his heart. What's that? That's faith. But Paul said, let's go to verse 10. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. In other words, the work that accompanied the faith of salvation is the confession of his lordship. That was the work. That was the corresponding action to faith that released it and put it into, put it into operation. And the, and the man at Lystra, who was impotent in his feet, the corresponding action was to stand up. Okay? James is simply saying that faith without corresponding actions doesn't work. He even said this, devils believe and tremble. Remember what he said? Looking back over here. In James chapter 2, if a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say, Depart, peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them those things which are, give not those things which are needful to the body, what does it profit? Oh, Lord, bless them. There's no faith in that. It's a cop out. God's going to do something for them because I said bless them. No. You go get something and give it to them. You do something about it. Because there's no profit for you to say, I have faith. Be ye warmed and filled. Go your way. <laughs> Hello. He said it doesn't profit anything. Even so, verse 17. If it, if, even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. What's he saying? He's saying that faith that does not have action if you, got, if you say, I have faith in God, and I believe I'm born again, I'm a child of God, according to Romans, I mean Ephesians 2.10, there should be actions that correlate with that action of faith. You can't say, I'm going to go out and commit adulteries and fornications and drink and shoot up, but it doesn't matter because I'm under, I'm under grace. Hello? If you're truly under grace and you're saved by faith, you will have actions that are demonstrative of that faith. The, the, the one of the, the most uh, abused sayings right now is, uh, you, just, you just rest in him and look at the finished work of Jesus, and, and, and nothing else matters. It doesn't matter what I do. Somebody told me that I'm going to be blessed. I'm going to be blessed in my giving. I mean, I'm going to be blessed even if I don't give. God's going to take care of me financially. We just read Sunday how 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9 say this, that if you don't sow, I mean, I mean he that sows little reaps little. If you sow bountifully, you'll reap bountifully. So that tells me that there's a corresponding action to your faith that he takes care of you financially, and that is to be a sower. I know we're, we're, recap, we're recapping back in the time back into Sunday. Sowing the seed. Remember, he gives seed to the He gives seed to who? Sower <clears throat> denotes action. Planter. A worker. Amen. 
Didn't James, look, didn't James say in chapter 1, if any man be a hearer of the word and not a doer, what? That's right. He's like, um, um, well, actually, back up one verse. Be you doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Lack of action that corresponds to your faith is deception. And there are people selling books and selling videos and getting people just following them around like a dog after a bone because they're telling them they don't have to be a doer. All they got to do is believe. And they're leading them astray. Because James says that the hearer who does not do is self-deceived. Hardest deception to get people out of is self-deception. I've, I've, I've been in the ministry over 30 years. I know. I've ministered. I've counseled. I know. The hardest deception to get. See, when somebody else has somebody deceived, you can get them out. If you can get them out from under their influence, they'll just they'll go like, but, oh, man. And they'll come to their self. I'm sharing the word with them, but getting out from under their influence. But when somebody is self-deceived, who you get them out from under? And let me say this. Usually the self-deceived have something attached to their deception called pride. I said usually the self-deceived have something attached to their deception called pride. Because they don't want to be wrong. Even if they begin to see that they're wrong, They'd rather be wrong and maintain their position than to be called out and shown that they were wrong. Now, Dad Hagen used to tell the story about the preacher that he was going and he was holding a meeting for for him, and and in, that, in those days, you know, people don't do this much anymore. Back in those days, they used to stay. Traveling ministers would stay in the pastor's home most of the time. Now you got people. Oh, I can't do that. I might you know I might get caught up with the wife, and. Uh, I mean, you know, we, we have such lack of integrity in the, in the church today. Women, women accusing men of stuff they didn't do, and then men are scared they're going to get accused of something they didn't do, and then uh, actually pretty much afraid that if they get the opportunity, they're going to take it. Now, look, we have, we have policies in place to protect us. We do the same thing. We, I don't counsel women alone. Uh, but, you know, back in those days, they stayed in the homes of the pastors. That was, that was normal. And so the pastor's out doing his stuff. Brother Hagin's up, and he'd be, you know, um, he, she cooking breakfast with him. He'd be talking to her, and and um, she say, "Brother, he can talk to my husband. He needs to hear what you got to say." He said, "Well, he said I've tried to talk to him already. He said, but he's got to be at the radio station. He's got to be doing this. He's got to be doing that, and, and he just won't come." She said, "But he needs to hear what you've got to say." He said, "Yeah, I know it." Well, about that time, he came in from running an errand, came into the house, and and uh, sat down, and finally, Brother Hagan said. Uh, you need to come hear what I got to say in the morning services. It'll help you. He said, yeah, I know it. He said, but I, I don't, I'm, I'm not going to. And Brother Hagin looked at him and said, don't you know you're going to die? He said, yeah, I do. But I'd rather die than admit I'm wrong. Yeah, I know what you're telling is the truth, but I'd rather die than admit I'm wrong. He closed the meeting down that week, went to the next church. He said he'd fall dead in his pulpit two weeks from this Sunday. Two weeks later, got the call. He fell dead in his pulpit. What was that? Self-deception got connected to pride. And even when he saw he was wrong, his pride wouldn't let him admit it. And we got people like that all the time. I had a roommate. <laughs> Caps had a roommate. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah, I had a roommate. Now, you know what he told me when we went out to Tulsa? Because we, the three of us went out to Tulsa from the same town. There was about, there was five or six of us from Greenwood that all went the same year. <clears throat> Back at 80, 81 school year. And he told me, on, he told us on the way out, I'll be teaching. The Lord showed me I'll be teaching at Raymond before the year's out. And, of course, I was so young and dumb, I thought he was actually going to be doing it. 
I know, I know that Dad Hagen and Pastor Hagen had to look out their window as the kids drove up on campus, you know, back in those days, and just look out there and think, we got a lot of work to do. I mean, one of my roommates had, had gotten an old, nor, uh, uh, um, old, I forgot, Carolina Telephone van, work van, and the, the, all the lettering had been taken off. It was kind of this orangey brown, uh, no, golden brown, ugly, ugly, cow dropping brown, all right? <laughs> got it? We took shoe polish and painted up our cars before we left town. I mean, my back window had to ram or bust. Tulsa, here we come. On the front of his van, he took shoe polish and wrote God Squad. Remember back then, the Mod Squad was out. God Squad. We drove up on campus. Wow, for Jesus. Yep. Young and dumb. Oh, man. Then, then they had this guy, had this, had this conversion van, a big regular van. Had, I'm talking thousands of dollar paint job, murals put on there. People in hell screaming out, why didn't I listen? I mean, professional, professional paint jobs on the van. I'm telling you. I'm, and it had to be several thousands of dollars. It was like airbrush professional. I mean, it's very not, very realistic looking. Why didn't I listen? You know, and it had all the scriptures about repenting or burning in hell all over it, you know. We got a lot. I know they had to think we got a lot of work to do. But my other roommate, yep, he thought he was God. He thought, I mean, he, you know, he just walked and Dad Hagen got in the spirit in camp meeting 80 and, and Brother Noble came up and took over the camp meeting. He couldn't talk for the rest of the service. And next thing I know, my whole, the whole half the year, he that's a vanity. That's vain. Was not Abraham our father justified by works? Now, when you read it, it talks about how Abraham went and did, you know, Abraham was justified by his faith and so forth. But the faith was, was demonstrated by his willingness to actually offer Isaac to the Lord on that altar. And it was accounted. His, and you see, read Romans. You can pick and choose. You can't cherry pick the scriptures and leave out the stuff that don't, you don't like. I know Romans 4 says, so he was being justified by his faith. Was it, and his faith was accounted to him for righteousness. But James comes over and says, wasn't it really when he offered him on the altar that he was accounted for righteousness? See is how that faith wrought by, with his works, and by works was his faith made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled. Abraham believed God. It was imputed to him for righteousness. And he was called. See, people pull that out. He believed God. It was counted to him for righteousness. Yeah. And, and his believing God had him go offer his son to the Lord on the altar. His actions corresponded to what he believed. And when you read Romans 4, it says, account that even God was able to raise him up from the dead, even that he did in a figure. He didn't lay down and go, God's going to bless me because I'm under his grace. God said, go do something. He believed him. He, God said he's going to do something. And then when he said, offer him on the altar, he, because he believed he was going to be that seed, the sand of the seashore, the stars of the heaven, he went to offer him up, fully expecting to kill him, burn him on that altar, and then God raised him up from the dead out of those ashes because he, had, he believed the word, so shall that seed be. Amen? You, got, you just look at Romans 4. And sometimes I'm wondering, you know, how people read stuff and don't get it. Because they're deceived. They're self-deceived. Amen? Who against hope, believe in hope, that he might become the father of many nations. According to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And then he offered, then he offered, he went to offer Isaac up. So understand, you don't go, I believe, that my needs are met, and you never give. Now people come here and tell me, I don't believe in tithing. Well, then you're a God robber. Hello? 
That's under the Old Testament. I don't care what it's under. God said people who don't bring the tithe and offering are God robbers. And he said Jesus is still receiving them. That's just, just, just lovely, isn't it? Lovely, lovely, lovely. Oh, wouldn't it be lovely? Lots of chocolate. Anyway, I'm sorry. <laughs> what was that? What's that, what's that movie? <laughs> My Fair Lady. Yep. Yep. Yep, 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 yep. <laughs> Faith. See, we, we, miss it. We, we, we got to the point, we thought simply, conf- and I said the number, one way, the number one way to release faith is to say it. But there are places where you can't, saying it's not enough. Corinthians, 2 Corinthians makes it clear that giving, receiving a harvest, is based on how you sow. You can't confess a harvest without sowing. Go out here. Just do it. Go out here. Get you some land. Plow it up. Go get you some steaks and put on their corn. Put them all on. I I mean, have your image out there. Have your confession image out there. Got the corn label out there on that field. But don't put any corn seed in the ground. Ride by it every day and say, I believe I received my harvest of corn. Oh, I got the visualization. I got the picture in front of me every day. I got the picture of the corn on that stalk, on that stand out there, just reminding me that I've got a harvest of corn coming. I'm confessing it. You didn't do what you need to do to get a harvest. You didn't sow the seed. You can confess until you lose your breath and lose your voice and until every hair on top of your head falls out and you ain't going to get a harvest of corn out of that field. Until you plant the seed. Because you give seed to the sower and bread to the eater and multiplies your seed sown. Finances is an arena that you have to sow to get a harvest. You can't just confess that people are going, my God, when Paul, now listen, my God meets my need according to his riches and glory and by Christ Jesus. Go back and read that. Amen. Come on now. Go back and read it. Was it Philippians what? 4, 19? Now, verse 15. Now, you went with Philippians, or verse 14. Notwithstanding, you have well done that you have, did communicate with my affliction. The word communicate me here meant he gave them money. They communicated dineros. All right? Whatever your currency is. Now, you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me. And I mean, they didn't send him letters. Nobody sent me any money. As con- listen, as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. <clears throat> even, for even in Thessalonica, you sent once and again unto my necessity. They're sending him money, honey. Money, 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 money. Money. Oh, Jace. All right. <laughs> Not because I desired a gift, but I desired fruit that may abound in your account. For I have all in the bound, I am full, having received Ephrodias the things which you were sent, which were sent from you, an odor, a sweet smell, a sacrifice, acceptable, well pleasing to God. But my God shall supply all your need according to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Did you notice something? God met their need according to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus because they communicated into him in concerning giving and receiving. You can't take Philippians 4.19 out, 
run off, make it a confession, and expect your need to be met unless you did what they did to get that statement made over them. It don't work that other way. Well, it's Bible. Context. The context is you did, uh, you have done well because you communicate with my affliction. Next verse. You communicate with me concerning giving and receiving. Next verse. Even when I went to Thessalonica, you sent to my necessity. Not because I was looking for a gift. There was a necessity, there was a need there, and they ministered to it financially for the ministry. Now you've got preachers running around building their kingdoms because they want a gift. They want to tell everybody how they can, how they can live in a big house and have a $50,000 or $15,000 guard dog and six-car garages and get you inspired to give them more money so you can give up, so you can get rich. Paul said, you gave not because I needed a gift. I desired one. You gave because it was a necessity for my work. I don't have any problem. Listen, we've gone from one ditch to the other. I don't have any problem with preachers being blessed. But I have a problem with preachers raping the church so they can live extravagantly. And usually traveling and raping the local church so it can't do its job. Because they're getting, they're, on, they're using marketing techniques to, tr to draw the money out of the local churches to their mega ministry. Now, that's, I'm, not, I'm not saying that every ministry is like that, but there's too much of it. I said there's too much of it. Paul said, I didn't desire a gift, but I desired that fruit would abound to your account. But I have all abound, all I am full. In other words, he's saying God's, God's going to meet my need. Amen? But he received Ephroditus the things which they sent. They sent. Hallelujah. They sent to take care of what he was doing. And Paul said, because you did that, let me, I'm just going to interject a little um, um, paraphrasing here. Because you did that, my God will meet your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. It was based solely upon the fact they were communicating to him financially for his ministry in need. It was not a faith confession void of works. As a matter of fact, the blessing or the, con the, the declaration of that statement was made in response to an action that took place before they had the confession over them. They were doing it. And they were doing it without a faith confession. We're giving to Paul because he's going to meet our need and God's going to meet our need. They were just giving. And Paul said, because you're doing this, my God's going to meet your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. We start out on the confession side without the doing. Okay, Elvis has left the building. All right. Hallelujah. Y'all here, you're going home. Three people are here. Paul, think about this. He said, you did it. You did it not because I desired a gift. You sent to my necessity. They were not doing this to get a blessing pronounced over them. They loved God. They wanted to see the work of God go forth. They were just walking in good works. And because their works, then God said, so just, you can't go around, my God meets my need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus, unless you're doing what they did to get that statement declared over them. Can we get the Jeopardy song? Do, 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 That's my say lost music. <laughs> Amen? Yeah. I know people don't like that. We got we to gotta stop being manipulative. I, I, I'll tell you, my, if you're not friends with God Dunnick on Facebook, yeah. become friends with him. Tell him your pastor, one pastor is sheep, and he wants you to read your post. God... It spelled funny. It's like it's like Dunic or something. D U I N I N C I something like that. But God Dunic. Okay? Good stuff. 
And he gets on these threads of like this kind of stuff about preachers. Listen, don't you, don't you get taken up by somebody saying, you got to give up to a preacher so that you can get blessed. OJ's got them nailed. All right? The Bible tells us not to be greedy after filthy lucre. Listen, I believe, I, my, I believe that my needs as a pastor should be met. But it doesn't mean I need to be driving a, 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 a Lamborghini around. Hello? We want our pastor blessed. We want him to have a Lamborghini. What, what do I need, a car? I mean, that's, I mean, if you brought me one, I'd probably sell it. I'll be honest with you. What do I need with a car that we could, we could uh, you know, live debt-free and, and, and build six churches overseas with? Well, God wants you, we want you to be blessed of God. We want you to be blessed of God, you know? Paul went one place one time and wouldn't take any money. He just built, made tents for two years so he could preach. We, we've just got to change our mindset a little bit about the prosperity thing and understand that we need, a, we need to have a corresponding action to our faith. We love people. We want to reach people. The work of God's got to be done. Amen? Can I get, can I get a, a hearty amen? Amen. All right.